Go for it. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, AOP, Aspect Oriented Programming. And uh, who's heard of AOP before? Who's used it before? Okay, a little bit there. So the, the couple things we're going to focus on with AOP, and, and not just focus on how to use it, but why do we use it. And uh, one of the reasons I like to use it is because it reduces spaghetti code, or can reduce spaghetti code. So uh, we have this thing called cross-cutting concerns, and this code is sort of boilerplate that gets copied and pasted over and over in various portions of your code, and uh, it gets tangled up with other code. So we'll look at ways to uh, reduce spaghetti code. And the other thing I'd like to use PostChart or, or AOP for is to reduce repetition. Uh, so we have that same boilerplate. It's the almost identical pattern you see everywhere in different classes and different uh, parts of your project. So, but less is more. So let's reduce that repetition and avoid writing the same thing over and over again if we have to. So that's that's why we're going to use AOP. Let me tell you about myself here first before we get started. Um, I'm Matt Groves. I, I'm from Columbus. I've been coding since I was about eight years old, so I'm a guy who just really loves to code. I mainly work with .NET, um, but I also do other stuff like PHP, open source software, whatever uh, you know, whatever is interesting or it needs to be done. I have some acronyms here. I'm technically a professor at a university, even though it's just a part-time evening class, so it sounds fancier than it is. Uh, this one I want to highlight. I'm a PostSharp MVP. So I'm not a PostSharp employee, but I'm sort of a developer advocate for PostSharp. So I uh, just want to let you know, full disclosure in advance, that um, I, I really like PostSharp. Um, here's one of my favorite quotes here from Alan Stevens. Some of you guys may know him. Um, I'm not an expert, but I am an enthusiast. Um, I, contrary to the tweet that went out earlier today, I am not the nation's foremost expert on AOP. Um, <laughs> I'm probably not even the expert in Ohio. Uh, I may be the expert in my neighborhood. That's, that's <laughs> as far as I'm willing to commit to. Um, but I am very enthusiastic about it. I really like AOP. I really like PostSharp. I really think these technologies can really help us. But I'm not, I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers. The nation's foremost enthusiast. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and also my class score is 55, guys. 55. I just want you to know that. <laughs> hey, my cloud score went up earlier this week. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, another one of my favorite quotes here uh, from C.S. Lewis. I write for the unlearned about which I'm unlearned myself. Uh, so again, I'm not some all-knowing oracle up here bestowing my wisdom upon you. Uh, I'm just like you guys just struggling to uh, figure out what works and sort of spread that enthusiasm as best I can. Uh, so that's sort of why I've been working on this book, Aspect Oriented Programming in .NET. Uh, it's uh, not in print yet, but it is available to buy an early preview. You can uh, check out um, my blog up there, crosscuttingconcerns.com, or the landing site right there, uh, check it out. And I'll give you a coupon code later so you can get it at a discount. <clears throat> Okay, so before we get started with AOP, let's uh, talk about a few terms here, a little bit of the history of AOP. So in the late 90s, these guys from Xerox Park, they sat down and they started analyzing object-oriented programming and some of the issues they saw with maintenance and bugs uh, that were caused, caused by some of the, uh, the, the paradigms, the, the patterns of object-oriented programming. And so what they came up with is they came up with these, uh, these two terms here, scattering and tangling. So here's an example of a couple classes in pseudocode here, uh, just business modules. And they have some methods that perform some core operation. That's the green code. And they use some core data numbers. That's also green to perform that operation. And so that's great. Um, the class just does that core operation. But of course, what goes into production is not just that. Usually you have to add some extra stuff in there, like in this case, logging. So we want to log um, just a, a trail uh, for debugging, or maybe some audit information, or um, you know, what have you, performance information, etc. So you have to go in here, and then inside method one, you got to write some code to log the start, and then at the end of the operation, you got to write some code to log the end of that operation. And so you do that here in this method. So that red code gets mixed with that green code, and that's the same method. And so they called this tangling. So you had this cross-cutting concern of logging 
that gets tangled up with the core operation of the method of the class. And then the other problem is you see that this same pattern, this same boilerplate, log start, log end, log start, log end. It happens in all the methods and in multiple classes. So they call this problem, they call it scattering. So you have this issue of your code getting tangled up and scattered throughout the language. So if there are language of the project. And so if there's a problem and you have to fix it or you want to make a change, you have to go and correct this everywhere. So it's, it, this is sort of the beginnings of spaghetti code, right? So the, the problem then is how do we split out this logging code to encapsulate it and make it separate? And then how do we reuse that once we split it out? So that's what uh, aspect-oriented programming uh, aims to solve. So I mentioned this term cross-cutting concerns already. Excuse me. And uh, logging is an example of that. That's sort of the most popular example of cross-cutting concern. But there are other things, um, like caching. And these, these things are just um, sort of uh, non-functional requirements that get used all across your application. So logging may happen in the UI layer may happen in the business logic, may happen in the database layer, uh, may happen in all three, and it may happen in multiple classes, multiple methods. Same with caching. Uh, the same is true for data transactions. They often get uh, reused a lot within a, within a layer. Uh, defensive programming, so you're checking to see if an argument is null or an argument is negative. That happens a lot in all, in all layers. Oh, yeah. so, that, so those are some examples of cross-cutting concerns, and that's what AOP is meant to deal with, is, is trying to encapsulate those cross cutting concerns out. Okay, so most, most of the session here just coding, just doing some coding and showing you how AOP works. But here is the, the roadmap for what I want to cover today. So we're going to start with an application that has no caching built into it. It's just a plain application that gets some data and shows it to uh, the UI. Then we're going to add caching to it in a very uh, sort of simple, naive, straightforward way. And then we're going to try to refactor that without using AOP, just to see if we can get it to get, get it to clean up by using just normal uh, design patterns. So we'll try with the dependency inversion first. And we'll try it again with dependency inversion with a more functional style. Um, and then we'll refactor it again with the decorator pattern. Anybody familiar with the decorator pattern? So we'll, we'll do those things. Um, it's just in great. We might not get to this depending on the time constraints. And then finally, after we've done all that, we'll start introducing a third party tool for aspect oriented programming. And we'll start with uh, Castle Dynamic Proxy, which is open source, and uh, PostShark, which is another tool that's uh, free. And hopefully, we'll be able to cover both of these, but uh, we'll at least cover one of those today. Uh, so that's the, that's the sort of um, roadmap I want to take through the example. Um, this project is somewhat contrived. It's very much demo code. Uh, it's an ASP.NET MVC. Everybody familiar with that framework? You don't have to be experts, but if you're familiar with it, that's, that's fine. Uh, I chose MVC because I'm familiar with it, and it makes dependency inversion pretty simple. Uh, but it's not really central to the, the AOP here. Uh, I'm creating a reporting application, so it's a very, very simple version of a reporting application. Um, it has three layers. We're going to have a UI layer, which is MVC, a service layer, which is where we'll be doing most of our coding, and a data layer, which is just pulling information from a, a, a database. Uh, the data layer is not a real data layer. It's just supplying random data to us. Uh, but obviously, you can imagine if we hooked it up to a real database, we could do all that work. But again, not central to what we're trying to demo here. And I'm going to use uh, ASP.NET's built-in cache. Now, you could use some other caching technology if you want to, a database or app fabric or, or what have you. But I'm just going to use ASP.NET Cache to keep it uh, straightforward and simple here. OK, and before we start coding, I'm going to make some assumptions here. Um, I'm going to assume you guys are familiar with C Sharp and .NET, hopefully, because it's .NET user group. I assume you're familiar with MVC. You don't have to be an expert, but I'm familiar with it. Uh, how about dependency injection? Everybody familiar with that? Who is not familiar with that concept or dependency inversion? Okay, 
Um, I'm not going to go into that too much. If you have questions about it, I'll be glad to talk to you afterwards. Uh, and then for dependency injection, I'm going to use a tool called Structure Map. Well, there's lots of tools out there. Structure Map is the one I'm most comfortable with. So, but you can use other ones, Ninject or what have you, uh, to the same effect. So those are just some assumptions I want to start with uh, before we get started coding. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. I'm going to just sit down for this if you don't mind. <clears throat> Will you guys in the back tell me if the uh, if the font's big enough for you? Does it look okay? All right. You think bigger? Little? You can do that. About uh, 16. All right. Okay. So I've got an MVC project here. And I just have one controller. It's called Home Controller. It's sort of the default one that you start with the project. Uh, this has just an index action and an index post. And it has a dependency on this reporting service. So let's see how this works when I run it, just to give you an idea of what this app actually does. Okay, so here is just a very, very rudimentary report application. So I'm entering in some report parameters, and then my group ID is 765, whatever. Include forums, no. So you could have many other options here, but this is just some basic ones. And then this display down here at the bottom is showing all the values that are currently in the ASP net cache, which we're starting out with none. There's no values in there. So I hit submit. And now um, it's simulating a sort of a slow database call uh, with just a thread.sleep, just to give you an idea uh, that, oh well, wait, I shouldn't be caching yet. It's a fraud. Services. Oh, started the wrong step. There we go. Sorry, guys, let me try this again. Okay, so we're starting out with no caching. So our data service, is, I've made it artificially slow just to give you the idea that some caching might help in this, in this case. So it's taking a few seconds there, and now it gets back to these report results use threads, users, and notice there's nothing in the cache now. So if I hit submit again, it's going to again make the trip to the database, which someone at the last conference called this the walk of shame. So it goes all the way to the database and it comes all the way back. <laughs> so you can see it, it's slow there. So we're developing this code and we think some caching might help, so let's, uh, let's take a look at the service here. So here is the uh, report service. In this case, all it does is it has a dependency on the data service, and all it does is just a simple pass through to get that data. Now, in the real app, you'd have some more logic here, some validation, some um, business logic, what have you, but this is just a pass through. It's not doing anything special out of the ordinary here. It's just calling that, that, uh, that get data method. So, uh, if we wanted to add caching to this with ASP.NET's cache, here is a way we could do it. We could modify this method, get report data. So notice that the get data method is still being called here. So that was what the code was before. So that's the green code. And now all this stuff around it is sort of the red code. So the first step is I'm building up a cache key. So if you're familiar with ASP.NET's cache, you have the cache value, and that's tied to a cache key so you can pull the value back out. So the first thing I do is I create a unique cache key based on the arguments passed in. So that's the group ID that we entered, uh, an underscore, and then a Boolean, our forms included. So this is just going to be a string that says like one, two, three, underscore, true, or four, five, six, underscore, false, etc. 
So it's going to be a unique, unique value based on the arguments that are passed in. So once I have that key, the first thing I do is check to see if the value is already in the cache. So that's this step right here. If the cache, given this key, is not null, then the value is already there. So I don't have to do the walk of shame. I can just return that value directly, uh, casting it to report results, and return that report. So I don't have to do the get data here. I can just return immediately. But if I'm running it the first time, I still have to do the walk of shame. So here, here I call the data service, get the result. So once I have the result, I want to put it in the cache for the next time this request is made. So uh, cache.add, the cache key that I created, and the result. And then this is a bunch of noise here, but it really means just cache it for 30 seconds. And then, of course, at the end, return that result to, to the user. Okay. So any questions on that so far? Does that look pretty, I mean, it looks kind of noisy, but does that look pretty straightforward as far as caching goes? Okay. So let's see how it works. So here's my app again, and I can enter a uh, group ID number, include forums, no. So I hit submit. It's taking its time doing the walk of shame the first time. And it comes back with the result. But now notice we have something in the cache now. So I have this key that I constructed, 851 underscore false from a Boolean. And then it's storing this report results value. So if I hit submit again, no walk of shame, it returns the result immediately. So I can do that for the next 30 seconds if I want to until the cache is invalidated, and then I have to do the walk of shame again. Get the idea there. I can enter another key, for instance. Now it's doing the walk for a different set of results. <coughs> right, so there you go. Okay, so um, so that works. Now we've got caching in our app. Our app's faster. Our users are happy. Uh, can anyone see any problem with this approach, though? Maintainability. <coughs> so. Maintainability, yes. And why is maintainability an issue? Complicated to get that code. Exactly. So in this this contrived example, I have one method. If your real app only has one method, then you're good. This is fine. But in a real app, you could have a dozens, hundreds of methods that you want to have results cached. So you have to copy this red code into each method. And if you wanted to change something like the number of seconds, oh, geez, now i got to go and change that 30 every every place. So none of you guys really would do this, right, in a real application? Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't have done it when I first started programming, my first job. So uh, we want to refactor this, obviously. So let's, uh, let's not hit AOP just yet. Let's try another way, though. Let's try... Um, refactoring this into its own uh, service, a separate caching service, so another object to handle the caching. So here is my new report service. I still have a data service coming in as a dependency. Now I've got this cache service coming in as a, as a dependency as well. So I've got two services now, um, or I've got one service depending on two services. So that cache service, let's go look at that cache service. So here's the cache service. It's an interface with three methods. Is cached tells me whether or not it's in the cache or not. Uh, set cache value, which will store the value, and get cache, which will retrieve it from the cache. And then I can implement this with any, any cache technology I want to. In this case, I'm using ASP.NET cache. So uh, I'm just moving that, checking the cache into here, adding the cache into here, and getting the cache here. So I've actually solved another problem that um, we didn't talk about, which was that this report service was tightly coupled to ASP.NET's cache technology. So if we wanted to switch to another cache technology, it would be very difficult to do that. But now we've refactored it to its own service. So if I want to switch from ASP.NET cache to using, say, a Raven as a cache, I could just implement a new implementation of this interface for Raven and switch them out. So we've solved that problem. Um, so back over here in report service, I've changed my get report data method. 
So I'm still doing the same thing at the beginning, getting that cache key, constructing it the same way based on the args. But now instead of calling HTTP context directly, I'm calling that cache service to say, is this key cached? If so, return that value. Don't do the walk of shame. So this line right here is, is the walk of shame. And then down here, once the walk is, is completed, set that value into the, into the cache. So we've refactored uh, caching into its own service. We've, we've uh, decoupled them. Um, but is there still an issue here? Yeah, there's no issue with having all that code that Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. So it's, it's better code, but it's still a lot of uh, stuff we have to copy and paste to reuse it. So this is, again, better, but uh, I think we can do better than this. So let's, um, how are we doing on time here? How long do you usually go? I'm going to keep you all night. Until the beer runs out. <laughs> I heard as much about Tennessee. <laughs> OK, so um, what I'm going to do now is stick with dependency in injection. So uh, I'm still going to have a cache, a, another service passed in, but now it's going to be called a cache wrapper. So I'm going to take more of a functional approach to doing this. So now my, my new interface for caching has one method called cache wrap. And it takes in uh, an argument of a func. Everybody familiar with func? Basically a, a lambda anonymous uh, function Excuse me. that returns type t, and then the cache key. <coughs> and that cache wrap is going to return uh, the object from the cache. So I have this code here, and you can see it looks very similar to the code we had before. It starts by checking the cache. If it's already in there, just return that value. And then instead of calling that service, what it's doing is calling that method that's being passed in. So it's sort of wrapping that method and getting the result, and then putting that result in the cache for 30 seconds, returning that result. So we can see the difference here if I use this cache wrapper down here in report data. So I'm still constructing the cache key here. Uh, but now what I'm doing is I'm creating a func that returns report results. And inside of that is a lambda to do our walk of shame, to go and get the data from the data service. And then what I'm returning is uh, whatever value that cache wrapper gives me. So it's sort of acting as a, as a wrapper to this method. So some of this uh, syntax is a little funky. We got lambdas and we got funks and all this stuff going on here. Um, so, but uh, would you would you think this is an improvement on, on previous? If you had multiple cross cutting concerns in this way, your business logic is going to be increasingly obscure, obscured by all that boilerplate. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with that. So it's a little more com complex, and uh, I, I probably wouldn't use it. Um, so yeah, what if you have multiple, like you're saying, you're going to have this sort of uh, wrapper in a wrapper in a wrapper in a wrapper and so, and so on. So that's going to be a little confusing. Additionally, we still have the problem of we have some code that we need to copy and paste everywhere, right? So even if I could somehow move this cache key into the wrapper somehow, I still have to create this funk, and I still have to wrap that funk with the cache wrapper. So there's still a little bit of code there that I have to copy and paste everywhere. So there's still some tangling and scattering going on. So um, I would say this is a, roughly the same as before, maybe a little better. Um, but for maybe uh, someone who's new to C Sharp or unfamiliar with lambdas and funks, this might be a step backwards. It might be harder for them to read. OK. So any questions so far? OK, so the next thing I'm going to suggest is that we follow a design pattern called the decorator. So I've changed my report service, refactored it back to this. So this is what we started with. This is what we'd like to see, right? So it's, <coughs> it's just, doing the, just, just doing the single responsibility. It's just calling the data 
and returning them, doing nothing else. So it's back to just green code. That's what we want to see. So where'd the red code go? Well, what I've done is I've created this thing called uh, report cache decorator. So the decorator pattern is a way that you can um, you know, follow the open close principle. You can add um, behavior to a class without modifying the class itself. So I've created a new class here called report cache decorator. It implements the same interface that report service does. <laughs> so it, this implements report ser I report service, and this implements I report service. Uh, but notice one difference is that this constructor expects you to pass in a report service to it, and it stores that as the target. And so then it has the get report data method just like before. It's required for the interface with the arguments that come in. And now you can see that same caching pattern. So I'm getting the cache key. I'm checking to see if it's in the cache. I'm uh, doing the walk of shame. Uh, and I'm adding it to the cache key. But now notice that my caching is in this class. And my report service is in this, cl in this class. So um, I would argue this is probably the best you can do with just object-oriented programming. You have uh, all the caching in one class, so if you make a caching change, it's just over here. If you make a change to the report service, it's just over here. And they don't tangle, and they don't scatter. At least they, they, well, do they, do they still scatter? That's the question. Uh, so the way to actually implement this is um, using my dependency injection framework here, so structure map. So by default, uh, my structure map We'll just scan for the default convention, which means uh, if, 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 if um, this interface is requested I report service, it will assume that the implementation of that is the same name minus the I, so report service. So I report service goes to report service, I foo goes to foo, et cetera. So uh, structure map uh, does that with this default convention. That's not going to work though with the decorator. So what I need to do is add some additional code here. Just say whenever when I when I report service is requested, I want you to use report service, but I want you to wrap it with the report cache decorator. So whenever that's requested from structure map, it'll return that wrapped report service. So if you look over here at home controller, this is expecting I report service. What's going to actually get is the wrapped, the decorated I report or report service. So uh, we haven't run the application in a while. Can you go back to the structure map for a second? Sure. OK, thanks. Okay. So let's, uh, let's actually run this. We haven't run the app in a while. Let's see if it still works. Did you change those in Richmond? Yes. Yes. So here's my group ID and no and slow request doing the walk of shame. And here's the result and there's the uh, cache value. Hit submit again. Very quick result. Do another request. Slow request again. There we go. Very quick now. So there you go. So it's still working. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so you define the decorator and you define the, your report service. They're not tied together at that point, but at the IOC, IOC class, that's when you combine them, you put that report service into the decorator? Yes, exactly. That. Exactly. So that's what this enrich with is doing. Is, is a decorator, can you just say that's a wrapper or something? Like, what's the difference between that and just a wrapping an object and just um, holding it? Well, I mean, a decorator kind of is a wrapper. It's just sort of a formalized name for the, for the design pattern. Okay. Well, right, yeah, and, and exposes it, yeah, it uses the same interface. So that's the main thing with the decorator is that both the decorator and the implementation use the same interface. Okay, I report cool. service and I report service here. Okay, so we've got uh, a nice clean report service. It's all green code now. No more caching business in here. All the caching stuff's over here. So this is great. Um, is there any downsides to this though? 
got a lot of business classes. Right? Have a lot of decorators. Yeah. You're on the ball over there today. Yeah, twice as many files to work with. Yeah, well, that's one thing. So, because my decorator has to implement this same interface, if I want to cache some other class, I have to write another uh, decorator, uh, which is not so terrible. I could refactor this a little bit so I could get some reuse out of this. The decorators would be very thin. That's that's fine. But if you had, let's say, 100 classes and you want caching on all of them, you have to have 100 decorators and, and so on. So that could get out of hand. So you have a lot of repetition. And I'd argue that's uh, some scattering is still going on there. So there's some boilerplate, some um, extra code uh, that I don't, I'd rather not write. But if you have a smallish to mediumish project, this might be an OK solution. You might just go with this instead of introducing a third party tool. Um, this is going to give you the benefits of AOP with the downside of you have to maintain a few extra classes and files. So that's, uh, that's it. That's the, uh, the code I wanted to demo as far as non AOP code goes. So any questions so far? Just one question on the, on the app. The first time you went through it, you uh, loaded from uh, database and it showed one cache key, mm -hmm. and then you uh, loaded a different one, and it still showed one cache key. That's because I, I took too long and it expired after 30 seconds. So I thought no one noticed that. <laughs> okay. So, what, so is a decorator can only decorate one set of things? Uh, a decorator can decorate only anything that implements that same interface. So I have this class implements I report service. So any other class that implements that, it can also decorate that, that class. Any more questions? Okay, so instead of writing 100 decorators by hand, what I'd rather do is introduce a tool that's going to essentially write those decorators for me. Uh, dynamic uh, decorator, or as it's called, dynamic proxy. And that's the first tool we'll look at. It's called Castle Dynamic Proxy. So let me go ahead and switch this back. I think that's what I'm going to do next. So uh, once again, we're going to be using Castle Dynamic Proxy. So the report service is the same. It's the same exact code. It's, the, it's just the green code. It's very, very simple, very straightforward. Now I'm going to write something called a, an interceptor. So this is with Castle. Uh, Castle Dynamic Proxy used to be its own project. Now it's part of Castle.core. Uh, if you're familiar with Castle, it's a big set of .NET tools like Castle Windsor and um, I'll oh, use uh, Dynamic Proxy and some other stuff. It's a big, it's, it's sort of a big set of tools. But you can use Dynamic Proxy sort of on its own by just introducing Castle.core into your project. It's open source uh, and, and free. So um, this is a tool you can use. And what you have to create here is uh, an interceptor. And the way you do this is you implement this interface called iInterceptor. That's part of the Castle Dynamic Proxy library. It has one method, which is called intercept. Um, and it, it, whenever this is executed, it will get passed in an object that implements this interface. So the idea here is that you use this interceptor, and it intercepts any calls to the method. And you can actually run this code instead of the method you're intercepting. So uh, down here, you can see this piece of code right here, invocation.proceed. That's telling me to do the walk of shame. So call the method at this point. And then the code around it, it should look somewhat familiar. I'm building the cache key. I'm checking the cache to see if the value is already in there. If it is, I'm setting the return value of invocation to that object. And then at the end, I'm just putting that value in the cache key. And, uh, and there you go. Uh, now, I'm building the cache key a little differently this time. Uh, so we looked out here. I'm actually using uh, JSON to do this. So because we're passing in, because uh, we want this to work with any method, any class, 
I have to have a generic way to build out a cache key that's unique. Uh, and if I'm if I'm using an arguments object like uh, report args, uh, let's see, where is report args? Right here. If I have a report args object and I call two string on it, what is the string going to be? It's going to be namespace dot report args, which is not unique, right? So I, what I need is the value of group ID, the value of R forms included, and all the other values of a real args object. So the way I do that is I'll just use JSON to serialize that to a big JSON string. And that's going to be unique for each different object that is passed in as an argument. And you'll see how that actually looks here in a second. Um, but I'm just using the built-in uh, JavaScript serializer to get the arguments that are passed into this method call and to serialize them with JSON and join them together with uh, underscores if there's more than one. So notice that nothing in this interceptor references the report service, report args, or any specific class. So the idea is you can use this to decorate anything, any class, any method, including the report service here. And the way you wire this up is you go back to your IOC container and you introduce something called a proxy generator. So it's going to generate those decorators for us. So I create this new object, and then um, if the request comes in for I report service, I want to use report service, but I want to wrap it with a dynamically generated decorator. Let's scroll up a little bit, please. Scroll up. Yes, sir. Thank you. There you go. Let's scroll over a little bit here, too. It's quite long. Um, so again, I'm using enrich with just like it was up here. But instead of a class that I've already written, I'm going to create a class, uh, create a type at runtime that implements this interface using this blueprint right here in Cache Interceptor. So this is going to, at runtime, create a brand new type for us, a, a, a new decorator for us at runtime. that doesn't exist in our source code, but when we run this code, it'll actually exist in memory. And this isn't the uh, most off, uh, efficient way to write this, just sort of demo code. Um, but uh, so notice I'm calling the get interface proxy with target interface. And there's a couple different ways you can generate this, but I have the interface and I have my uh, target uh, interceptor. So I want to combine those two to create a decorator on the fly. Okay, so I think we're ready to go. Let's give it a shot. <clears throat> okay, so here's my group ID, 998, forms yes, submit, walk of shame is happening right now. Now notice what gets cached down here. So here's my cache key. It's a JSON string. Before I just had 998 underscore true, but now I have the full JSON serialized value. So once my report args gets more complex, this key will also get more complex because I want it to be unique for each request. And it's still caching the report results value right there. So if I hit submit, it'll be very fast. No walk of shame. 30 seconds passed because I was talking too much, so now walk of shame. Okay. So if you really had a lot of parameters and you didn't want to. Not all of them are required for. Is that ever the case? Um, to be unique. I, I so I, I use a cache aspect very similar to this in, in uh, uh, a product right now. So it's not been the case for me. But I could imagine a scenario like that. So in that case, you'd have to be more descriptive about what you want to be included. So you could, for instance, go over to report args, and let's say uh, I as cache key, add an interface to it that you define that has a cache key. So, And then you'd implement the instructions on how to build that cache key yourself. Yeah? Or if, if you're using the JSON serializer, you can decorate your, your 
class with if JSON ignore right but yeah. some other attribute that says don't don't use this when you serialize right right something like I don't know what it's called but yeah don't serialize so you could do that as well if you wanted to you know mix in that into your to your arms. and that becomes very important I think too especially when you look at caching scenarios where your cache trade or your can what you call a cache key mm -hmm. is if you're if you're in a situation where you've authenticated a user as you know, or in a security situation where your cache trait is specific to a set of you know, for a given authentication context. You don't want to necessarily cache something that this user or this authentication context has brought in, but you want to bring it back to that same context. But the other, this other context, you don't want to return it because it yep. may be something secure or Absolutely. sensitive. So Absolutely. definitely can see whether we even have that situation. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. So if you have two different users, they may see two different pictures of data depending on their credentials. So you may want to uh, make that part of the cache key as well. Yeah, definitely. Very good point. Uh, so I, I know I kind of went through this a little fast, but um, any questions on Castle? How to use it so far? Is it is it making sense? Uh, is there any? It parts? seems like that uh, this this is providing a mechanism to do uh, global action filter, executing and unexecuted, all at the same time in the business layer, as opposed to the MPC layer. Yes, exactly. If you look in my book, in fact, I introduced Action Filter as part of MVC. It basically is an aspect, in, in my estimation. So if you guys are familiar with Action Filters in MVC, uh, I, I Result Filter, I Action Filter, they're very much like this. But those are going to be applied to action methods in a controller, where in this case you can apply it to any class that gets returned by your IOC container. Very good point. Uh, unit test that interceptor code. Do you unit test it on its own or as it's applied to this object? What do you do for testing? So I can tell you what I what I would do, yeah. and then I can tell you what some other people would do. Uh, so I would probably uh, not write the interceptor this way. I'll probably go to talk about this later on. Actually, in some more slides, but I would not write the interceptor this way. I would probably introduce another layer of indirection and have this interceptor be very, very thin. And it's just calling some other code that's performing these cross cutting concerns. So it would actually call my a cache service object or something like that. So that way I would not necessarily test this interceptor directly. Um, that may be too much work for something like this, but that's, that's what I would do. Um, but uh, fortunately with Castle, it's very easy to test these aspects directly, or these, yeah, these aspects directly if you want to. Because of the nature of it, of the being just interfaces, you can introduce mock objects very easily here and, and test these directly if you, if you so choose. Now, uh, testing it, a unit test wouldn't work here because I'm using HTTP context directly. So again, you probably have to do some refactoring. That's where that extra layer will help you. Because then you can start to use IOC within your interceptor. So I'd have maybe a constructor here. Uh, that gets passed in the iCache service, etc. And then I could pass in the mock for that and then just test the logic of this aspect. But my preference would be just to make this one really thin and then test that other object on, on its own. So realistically on your created aspect or testing. Then you'd just be testing your HTTP context and actually you doing your mock. Right. Well in, in this case it's it's a very, very simple uh, Unit tests wouldn't give you a lot of value, but um, depending on how dogmatic you are, if you write code, you should uh, that the code should probably be tested, right? So any any piece of code that you can test, you should test. Um, but certainly the advantage here is that you only have this code in one place, as opposed to the decorator where it's in hundreds of places or when it was scattered before, it's even harder to test. <coughs> Um, so, and the other part of your question was, do you test it together with the code that you're intercepting? Uh, my preference would be no, don't do not do that. And with Castle, that's very easy to do that. With PostSharp, as we'll see, not as easy. Um, so, any more questions on Castle before I go on to PostSharp? Just, can you, can you say how significant performance it is doing this way? Uh, so, the way Castle works is that it uses reflection and emit, and it creates a new type at runtime. And that can be something of an expensive operation to do. 
However, once you do it, do that the first time, that class, that type is now out there in memory. You don't have to create it again. So it's sort of a one-time hit uh, to create that type. Um, so there's a small performance hit, but I think it's pretty insignificant. And um, you know, I think generally speaking, it's not going to be the bottleneck in performance of your application. Uh, o Sharp works a little differently. It actually runs at compile time, so it modifies your DLL files right when you're compiling. So that will affect your performance uh, of your of your build. It'll slow down your build a little bit, uh, but it won't slow down at runtime as much. Acting up again. Uh, so, but there are some other trade-offs involved with using PostSharp as, as we, we can talk about here. So, uh, people ask that about performance question all the time. I think the productivity benefits and the maintenance benefits far outweigh any performance hit that you might take from it. But again, your mileage may vary. Profile, you know, do some testing uh, on your own, see if it affects your app significantly. So the fact that Castle keeps a reference to this object once it's out there is going to keep the garbage collected. Then. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I mean, so the type is the type is created, and then Castle sort of keeps it keeps a reference to it, so it doesn't get blocked. Oh, okay. Thank you. There is one slight little point to consider too when you, when you choose between like something like uh, the proxy or something like PostShop or some other more static type of you know, um, situation is if you're doing something like a partial trust or normal trust scenario where uh, code generation is restricted, or if you're using something like Monotouch where on the device you yep. can't do code generation, you're stuck doing it. You know, ahead of time, either through something like you know, Photoshop or some other you know, programming type of operation, to get that code generated ahead of time, yep. so they can actually be compiled and not generated on time. Very, very true. Very good point. So yeah, like I, I don't know about Windows Phone or Silverlight or stuff like that, but reflection emit may not be an option in those cases. So it did this at, at Dayton. At the time. I thought it was I thought it was done. Some as a ghost, ghost <laughs> keyboard. Uh, so yeah, it's a very, it's a very good point. Uh, something to consider. Um, is this AOP, or are you just building up to why AOP is the best? This, <laughs> uh, I'm building up to why push sharps the best. No, but, yeah, this, this, this is AOP. I would consider this. This is definitely AOP right here. Aspect oriented okay. programming. So, and I would even say the action filters are aspect oriented programming. I mean, those are built into MVC, but it, it still is the essentials of aspects are there. So. Um, if you think AOP is something complicated and, and hard to do, uh, it's really not. It's just intercept before, after. There you go. Okay. I'll move on to the last example here. This is the best one. Say the best for last. Okay. So here is the uh, post sharp version. So it's the same code as before. Again, nothing uh, wacky inside here with caching. Uh, just the same report data as before. Uh, ignore that attribute for now. Pretend like it's not there. Uh, so, so what I've written here is another aspect. This uses post sharp, and it's using a base class here called method interception aspect. So this is part of the post sharp library here. Uh, by the way, these are both available on, on NuGet. So Castle is just install package castle.core, and PostSharp is install package PostSharp. So uh, like Castle, this has a method you can override called oninvoke, which is pretty much just like intercept. And it has another context object that comes in called method interception args, very similar to, to Castle. So I'm building the cache key, same as I was before. Basically, the, the contents of this is the same. Except uh, here I've got args.proceed instead of args. Uh, whatever it was, invoke or something. It was, all, it was also proceed, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. So it's very similar, except for this object is a different type. Company. Uh, cache key is the same as before, just using JSON to do that. Um, okay, so now I don't need to use my IOC container, though to specify that decorator. What I do instead is I go back to here and I put this attribute on top of the method that I want to intercept. So cache aspect is the attribute, which is what I called it here, cache aspect. 
So that tells PostSharp that when you compile, PostSharp will then take, start running the post compiler. It'll look at this attribute, it'll look at your aspect you wrote, and then it'll sort of combine them together. It'll smash them together by manipulating your IL directly. So I can stack them and add them to Yeah, you can add multiple attributes if you want to for different aspects, what have you. Uh, so let's, uh, let's begin to run here. So you can see that build process was so much slower. <laughs> so uh, do this. Walk of shame is happening. And then uh, we come back and we have the cache key with JSON and the value and then the results right here. Very quick. Uh, so so there, there you have it. That's that's how PostSharp works. You can there's an interception aspect with PostSharp. There's other types of aspects you can write with PostSharp, um, like a boundary aspect uh, for methods. You can also write aspects for properties, getters and setters. You can write aspects for just plain fields of a class. Um, unlike uh, Castle, you can write you can put PostSharp uh, interceptors on private methods or static methods. You don't need to. Uh, Get an object through an IOC container. You can do it on any object in, in the system. Just just apply an attribute to it. Um, and uh, so, and the PostSharp is not, not open source, though. Uh, it is a, there is a free version available, uh, but there's also a paid version that has a few more advanced features. But nothing I'm showing you here can't be done with with uh, everything I'm showing you can be done with the free version. <coughs> Okay, so uh, any questions on post sharp? Do you still test in isolation since you apply the cache aspect to the business logic? Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so the unit testing is a little more difficult in this case uh, because it's actually modifying the, the, the code itself as you compile it. So you're running a unit test against what it is. You're not running a unit test against this code. You're running a unit test against the code that gets combined with this code together. So it's the resulting code is a smashed up version of this plus this inside of this class. So the question is, can you test this in isolation then? And the short answer is no, not really. Uh, the long answer is, with some extra work, you can. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, well, I wish I could say that, but no. Um, How would you be able to access your ISE aspects without using service logic? Another good question. Uh, so let me uh, let me just say first of all, all this stuff is covered in the book. Uh, These are very good questions. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't know if I can give you a total answer in uh, the limited time we have, but. Um, so stand up for this, I guess. I need to type. So the first thing you need to think about is if I'm running this in a unit test, and I'm testing the code that's the aspect being applied to. So if I'm testing a report service, I don't necessarily want this cache code to run, right? When I'm testing it, I just want to test the report service in isolation and not the cache code in isolation. So what I could do then is uh, I have to be able to tell this aspect, don't don't run this code while I'm testing. So one way to do that is I could put in a, um, a global static boolean as, as a flag in my unit test. I'll set it to be true by default. And then um, in my unit test, say, OK, false. Don't run the aspect code. So then I'd have to put an extra if statement right in here that says, if this flag is off, then just return and do nothing. Or just proceed and do nothing, I guess. So, uh, so what you end up with is a little bit extra code inside of this this method in order to unit test the code under iso in isolation. So that is uh, some extra work you have to do. But the trade-off there is that you get the, uh, the sort of a more powerful AOP tool with PostSharp uh, because you can, uh, like the, the, the trust situation you talked about, and also you can apply. Um, Aspects to private uh, methods and static methods and properties and events and so on. 
that you can't normally do with a tool like that. that and the other thing I talked about was making those aspects very thin. And that will help you as well if you want to test a post chart aspect directly in isolation. That's going to be, that's going to be more difficult for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all is the reason you mentioned of the dependency. So if I have a cache service in here, um, I, I can't actually use the constructor to injection with post chart. Because this actually, if you notice, is a serializable up here. This needs to have a uh, parameter list constructor. I'm not sure should say that. Uh, it needs to have a constructor uh, that post chart, uh, so it uses attributes, right? So you can't pass in objects to an attribute constructor. Only um, value, object, value, and value, correct? So I can't pass in a service that way. So I'd have to then. There's another method in here called um, so I can override uh, on runtime initialize. So post sharp can actually run this code in here at runtime. So that's where I hook up my services. I have to use something like a service locator to do that. Instead of some sort of dependency injection, I have to use just a plain old service locator. So with structure map, that'd be object factory dot get instance, something like that, in there. So the, the short story is you can you can test, you can unit test aspects with PostSharp, you can unit test code that aspects are applied to, but it's more work. Is the trade-off worth it? Well, I'm not going to be prescriptive and say yes or no. Uh, try it. See if it's worth it or not. Um, See if you like Castle Dynamic Proxy better. Because uh, certainly between the two, if you're talking strictly about testing, Castle Dynamic Proxy wins, hands down. It's much easier to test because it's doing all its work at runtime instead of at runtime. But I believe PostSharp has some really good, powerful uh, benefits that other tools don't, don't have. So you have to figure out that trade off for yourself there. Does that help? I know that's, that's, that's sort of a short answer, but. It's a really complicated uh, story there. Yeah. Uh, can you please relate your first very first code, like start log and get log with this aspect? Now, back yeah. implement that start log and end log because everything is now aspect of attitude. So, how it's going to be implemented for start log? Implicitly, or how is it going to be? Yeah. So, and so with post chart, what I do here is I put the start log right here, set up this cache key part, and then here's the proceed, which goes to the method, does whatever the method does. When it comes back, and I write the end log right here. So, if I'm using like log for net, I'd say, you know, have a log for net instance in this class, log start message, you know, arguments, method name date, time, stamp, whatever, do that log, then proceed to the method, and then do another log to call down here. And then I just put that attribute on whatever class I want to log. So this would be called log aspect instead of cache aspect, for instance. In that aspect, how do you know the method name? Question. So this object that gets passed in, <coughs> method interception args, that contains a lot of contextual information about the method. So I can get the arguments that are passed in. I can get uh, the instance that this method exists in, assuming it's not a static instance. I can get information about the method itself. So method dot name, or method dot uh, declaring type, or method dot a member type, or what have you. I can get the uh, the instance of the object this method exists in. I, I think I said that. Um, I can get the return value or set the return value of the method here. So basically, this args object is how you interact with that method inside the aspect. Yeah? I think you think of something else because PostSharp have the ability to do this configuration by Um. I was thinking that somebody had showed once how to like, use a configuration file to tell it all, the, all these methods. So a uh, configuration file is different than configuration uh, by convention. Uh, configuration file, uh, not really 
particularly for PostSharp. Uh, there are other tools out there. I think uh, Spring, Spring.net. You can define all your aspects, interceptions with a big XML file. It's sort of based on the Java Spring framework, so it's sort of the same thing going on there. Uh, as far as uh, convention goes, configuration by convention. So in this case, I've applied uh, an attribute to one single method. And let's blow that up again. Let's say I have dozens of classes with dozens of methods each. I have to then take this attribute and put them on each individual method. And, you know, that's not too bad, but that's a lot of extra repetition in there. So there's some options to um, make that configuration a little easier. If I put the attribute up on the class instead, it'll apply that attribute to all the methods in the class. So if I have 10 methods, one attribute on the class, all those 10 methods will be cached. Uh, so that's one way you can reduce the number of attributes you have in your code. You can also take it another step up and go to the assembly level. And you can say, OK, I want to apply this attribute to all methods in all classes in this namespace, or all classes that end in the word service, or end in the word repository. So you can use a regex if you want to. So there's your, config there's your convention. You can say, by convention, I want any class that ends in a repository to be cached. And apply this cache aspect to do that. So there is, you have to define the conventions yourself, but there's the ability to do that in there. And you can do that with Castle Data Proxy as well. Um, that's why I like Structure Map, in fact. Because Structure Map has a very good uh, way of writing conventions. So you can define a Structure Map convention and then use that to say, OK, apply this castle and then a proxy to all repository instances. I don't have an example of this here, but again, it's in the book. There's an example of that uh, structure wrap conventions in the book. Excuse me. Uh, if you're stepping through that in a debugger or in a call stack, there. OK. <clears throat> OK, guys, every time I do an AOP related session, I get this question every time. Um, without fail, 100%. Very good question, though. Uh, the answer is bugging, certain post sharp now. Yeah. Because it manipulates the IL. You're concerned about the debugging not working or not lining up. Right. So uh, post sharp actually is pretty clever about this. It manipulates your IL, yes. It also manipulates the PDB file. So when you set a breakpoint, it will hit where you expect it to. So if I set it, um, So if we're trying to debug the aspect itself, if I set a breakpoint up here somewhere, it will hit that breakpoint before the method gets called, and likewise afterwards. If I set a breakpoint in the method, obviously it will hit that breakpoint as well. And the call stack will be preserved. And the, the, the way that works um, is the PDB files partially, but also because, um, like I said, the actual result code, and I will show an example of this prepared, but this is not the code that gets executed. So PostSharp actually manipulates this method, adds a bunch of extra stuff in here to do that caching. So uh, breakpoints will have no problem getting hit in there. And so it's just the PDB rewinding that says, OK, it's actually on this line, or it's actually this symbol instead of this symbol. Those are composable, so you can have a bunch of aspects on one method. Yes, so I can stack as many attributes as I want on here if I want to. Yep. Absolutely. So, uh, how does Rosalind affect your, this, the future of this talk? <laughs> you get that question sometimes too. Um, so, so everybody's familiar with Rosalind. It's sort of some next level stuff. It's not really released yet. It's a future thing for Visual Studio and C Sharp. It's a compiler as a service, right? So you can uh, call the compiler with in your code and essentially manipulate the code itself through the compiler. So it's a form of metaprogramming. It's very cool stuff. I think there is some overlap between the two. Um, so you can imagine the Venn diagram, right? So I have aspect-oriented programming and I have Rosalind stuff over here and there's some overlap. There's some stuff that one another is good at and stuff that they're not good at. So Rosalind is sort of more general purpose. You could use it, for instance, to Write an AOP tool. That's or, what I'm half wondering. I imagine that the post sharp will probably 
be leveraging a lot of the stuff where they're having to do sort of pleasant things now, maybe? Um, they, they might. Um, I'm really familiar with the Post Sharp guys, but uh, the founder of Post Sharp, the, the lead guy, you know, for tour. Uh, in my mind, he is in sort of the, the, the pantheon of C-sharp guys. He's like, it's, it's like John Skeet and Anders and then Gale's up there too. So I think he's probably already written like his own C-sharp compiler at some point. Uh, so he's pretty comfortable with that sort of thing. Um, but I, I think there's definitely some crossover there between the two, but I don't think that I'm not concerned about AOP going away or Rosalind like making it obsolete. I, I still think there's definitely room for, for both. I think there's even a blog post by Gail about, about Rosalind. The ghost. How are we doing on time, guys? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. How are Christ compiles you? Okay, uh, any more questions on post shark? Or any of the code I've uh, showed you. What about exceptional handling? Uh, within that? Yeah, uh, uh, PostSharp is great for exceptional handling. So you're talking within the aspect itself? Just how, how would you handle? I mean, it just. So you can write try catches and stuff in here if you want to. You can write whatever C sharp you want to in here. So. Um, you know, uh, in this case, if it's just an exception and, and some caching, you might just want to log that exception and keep going anyway, because you want the program to still function, right? Whether it's you get a cache value or not, you still want to function. Uh, some other types of aspects that might actually manipulate the return value or manipulate the arguments. In that case, it might just you might want to handle it very differently. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a fatal error or something like that. Um, you know, bubble it up a little higher and let the UI handle that error, that sort of thing. So it really depends on what type of aspect you're writing. Additionally, you can use uh, aspects to introduce exception handling into your code. So in this case, it's just an interception aspect, but there's a method boundary aspect that has an on exception um, sort of uh, override. You can override the on exception method. So whenever the method that you're bounding throws an exception, you can introduce an aspect to then handle that exception. So you can add exception handling and mass to your program with, a, with an aspect. So that's another sort of very common use case of, of post sharp. You can apply that to your entire uh, application? I don't know if I the whole application, but <laughs> you can apply it to large portions of it, yeah. <clears throat> All right. So, um, sorry, was there a question? Okay. So, uh, I've been talking a lot about AOP, and I think AOP is really great. And it's a great tool. It saved me lots of time, helped me be more productive, helped me write more maintainable code. However, it's not a silver bullet. It is not something that's going to solve all your problems. Uh, just like any framework, you have to uh, understand uh, when it's appropriate, what the trade offs are that are involved. We already discussed some of them between Castle and PostSharp. Um, there are, there are trade-offs. Um, you know, if there was a perfect a AOP tool, then we'd only have one. There wouldn't be a whole panoply out there to choose from. So what you're trying to tell us with this illustration here is that every time we pull the trigger on AOP or some framework, it's going to leave gunpowder residue in our hands so people can come blame us later? <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> Too much CSI. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you guys already brought this up, but one of the major trips you got to think about is how it affects your unit testing and your testing in general. So, um, you know, uh, we, me we mentioned some of the difficulties of using of writing tests around post shark, and uh, you know, writing tests with Castle is, is much easier. Um, but you need a way to manage the dependencies. You need a way to test those aspects in isolation test the code in isolation without the aspects applied. So those are things you have to think about. Uh, it's, not, it's not going to come for free. You've got to think about that stuff when you're running these aspects. So I propose, and I've been talking about this a little bit already, I propose that when you write these aspects, 
you write them to be very, very thin, very small aspects. So they sort of delegate all the work off to some other class. That's this. That's the saying, right? If the only the uh, the way you solve a problem in computer science is introduce another level of abstraction, right? The way of layer of indirection. So write those very thin aspects. So when you write an on invoke or an on begin, all it does is just immediately push off its work into another object somewhere else. And so avoid those really big uh, aspects, much like the ones I showed you today in demo code. Don't write them like that. Write them very small. So you don't have to test them directly. You can test that uh, other layer of indirection directly. But the aspects itself, uh, they're just very thin. They do the aspect work, but they push everything off into the other class. So there's two benefits to this. One is that it makes it easier to test. Two, it makes you less tightly coupled to a specific framework. So I could switch from post sharp to castle if I wanted to without having to gut all my code. I could just reuse that level of indirection, that cross plane concern, and just plug in a different AOP framework. So that gives you a cleaner architecture as well. So uh, I definitely suggest that you uh, write very thin aspects. And this is kind of like when you're writing MVC or MVP apps. You want to write very thin controllers or very thin presenters that do almost li very little work. They just direct traffic. So you, So all your code that is uh, pulling your business logic is held off into another class somewhere, and your UI code's over here, and the controller just directs traffic between them. It's the same sort of approach I want to take with aspects. Uh, I've been working at home for about three years now by myself in my basement office. I get lonely sometimes. So please, feel free to contact me. About.me slash mgroves. You get my email, my Twitter, my GitHub, everything on there. Ask me questions about AOP. Ask me questions about dependency injection. Send me a funny cat picture. Whatever. I just <laughs> just want someone to talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, my, my blog about AOP is crosscuttingconcerns.com. You can get to my book from there or Manning right here. If you want 40% off my book, you can go to Manning and enter that code. Uh, or if you don't like my book, you can go and use that code to buy uh, John's Keats book. Uh, any more questions about AOP or anything? Yeah, actually, I actually have a question. Um, so I assume that PostSharp has something to get installed process on after the code. Yes. And it's your CS function. And if you install it from the NuGet package, mm -hmm. are the MS tasks that it adds to your CS process added to? Uh, so it will modif So the question is basically, how does this work with a build server? Right. Uh, so, uh, so when you install the NuGet package, it'll work for your machine locally. However, PostSharp needs a license to to run it. Even if it's a free version, you still need a free license. So you need to install that license on the build server as well. You'll need to install the PostSharp post compiler on the build server. So that post compiler does not get committed into your repository. It's a separate piece of software that's installed um, separately. So, um, but it's I've done it. It's fairly painless, and it works with Team City just fine. If you're using Team City or other build servers, I'm sure it'll work fine too. Um, I'm getting a giving away a free copy of the book to some lucky winner tonight. So, don't forget that. I just need your name and email address before you leave. Whoever wins that. We'll draw for that first. So, uh.